Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. It, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, author of of the series of books, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. Nine volumes available at Amazon in paperback and ebook format. And volumes one through nine, that's right. If you're unaware of it, volume nine is now available at Audible, iTunes, and Amazon as well in audio format. So please... A lot of hard work goes into these things, folks. A little show of support. Go out and buy a copy. And now, may I introduce you to my brother and co-host, KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you? I'm doing all right. What's up with you, Bill? Well, a little rain coming down today, but uh, we're doing good. My forecast is for a mild winter and an early spring. All right. <laughs> I'm that's up my, for that. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, I just got shocked about 30 minutes ago, which I think the storm is gone now, but here it is, uh, you know, here in North Carolina. It's Sunday night. It's been a chilly, rainy day, and I bend over to take off my shoes, and I'm looking down at the ground, and I see this, like, white flash in the room, and I'm thinking... Did I just see something or like, I mean, the brightest white flash, but I'm looking down at the ground, you know? Uh-huh. And then about five seconds later, kaboom. Ooh. Yeah. A little lightning strike close by, and then we had three more. Wow. Big booms. So if you hear something that sounds like a bomb going off, it's just the lightning. <laughs> it's just the lightning. Just the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing good. Uh, things are looking up a little bit, and uh, too bad. I don't know when this particular podcast will launch, but we're having a really weird playoff here in the football. Uh, you know, the Giants went up in smoke, and, you know, we didn't expect a lot from them, but the way they played against no, I, them. I didn't think they would win. I was pulling for them for sure, but yeah. they, like, ooh. What did uh, the coach say that they had a crash landing? I think. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I don't. Nobody expected them to be in the playoffs, uh, let alone win a game. Uh, so I think we did well, and then uh, Buffalo just got clobbered today. I know. I know it's disappointing. I mean, don't worry, you, all you folks out there in Ohio. Uh, we we love you. Don't worry, but you know, like those Bills. I just you know. Maybe it's because they have the same name as my brother. I wanted to see him go to the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's a little shocking, right? Yeah. And and like you said, since he whooped them. Yeah, I mean, uh, they they got whooped as bad as the Giants got whooped. They did, yeah. And, and then you uh, got good old Dallas that can't hit an extra point. Yeah, that that field goal kicker is just... <laughs> he just missed his fifth in a row. Yeah. <laughs> Who misses five extra points in a row? I don't know, but me and uh, one of my coworkers, Vinny, uh, last week were rooting for the guy when he kicked four in a row. <laughs> he missed four in a row. Yeah. And we were like, this has to be some type of record for yeah, all time. Yeah, and the first it. extra point of the game tonight. I mean, it was technically it was blocked, but uh-huh. if you look at the replay, it was going to miss 10 feet to the left. That's yeah. how it was blocked. Yeah, he's better off it got blocked. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he kicked it at the guy. 
I can't get it through. Oh, I might as man. well kick it at somebody and say it was blocked. <laughs> Now, folks, you know, in case you're new to this podcast, uh, my brother and I do this remotely from each other, 600 miles apart to be exact. So when we call each other up, it's it's like a hello, and uh, then we bring you in, and our first segment is called Cryptids in the News and Other Oddities. We bring some strange topics to the table, and then I generally do a uh, account on Bigfoot, and uh, we wrap things up with some of the mail coming in, coming in from the listeners, listeners such as yourself. So if you've That's seen right. something, yeah, and in between we do a weather forecast, fishing forecast, <laughs> stuff like that, <laughs> and we talk a little football trash. Yeah, but <laughs> like, Kev, what do you got tonight? Not cryptids in the news and other oddities segment. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, Bill, we are going to Victorio Peak, New Mexico. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so this is a strange place. So uh, it's really a place of treasure and mystery more than uh, cryptids and hairy men. But I think it's an interesting thing to talk about for a few minutes. So uh, okay, we're going to dive in. You know any of the history of this place? Uh, I, I, I think there was some, a hoard of gold reportedly hidden there, right? That just kind of... Yeah, the accidentally discovered. So, uh, you know, and it goes back to 1937, mm-hmm. an American businessman and a bit of a gold, uh, gold hunter called Doc Noss, N-O-S-S, mm-hmm. um, he discovered some gold down there with his wife. Uh, really kind of stumbled again, stumbled across an old mine, and we'll talk about it in detail, but he really brave guy climbed down into this thing and found an unbelievable amount of gold. And then later on, uh, you know, about, I guess about 15 years later, uh, 12 years later, sorry, he got into an argument with someone who was helping him uh, search for the gold, and he was killed. Oh, man. Um, and then his wife tried to get uh, back to get, you know, the lion's share of the gold. But at the same time, this this place, Victoria Peak, which we'll talk about its history, it's actually on the sands, oh, sands, on the land of the White Sands mis- Missile Range in no uh, New Mexico. Now, wait a second here. So this guy finds this gold climbing down the ship, but he didn't remove any of it. He removed some of it. Like, okay. it's it's uh, it's not clear, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes, how much he actually removed, but there was certainly a lot of it there. Now, we're talking like, uh, when you say he removed it, it was already mined, or was it bullion? What, what was it? Oh, good question. It was treasure. So wow. it wasn't, uh, it was in a mine shaft. Okay, but he wasn't using a pick and a chisel to get the mine. There were gold bars down there, jewels, crowns, stuff like that. Wow, can yeah, you imagine? No. Wow. So the guy who was who was the other guy that killed him? Um, I mean, was he like a partner or something? He or? was. He came in late as a partner, so mm-hmm. he was his associate. His name was Charlie Ryan. And uh, uh, Charlie accused Noss of fraud, and then Noss threatened to kill Charlie Ryan, and uh, Charlie killed him. Boy, oh boy, follow the money, as they always say. Follow the money. Greed, greed, greed. Yep, yep. Yeah, so So, let's let's talk a little bit about how this uh, got started. Okay. This... this, uh, uh, peak and it's Victoria. You know, you want to say Victoria, but it's this craggy outcropping of rock about 500 feet tall, and it's in the center of the desert in a place called the Hembrio Basin in New Mexico. Okay, and um, so it's very desolate place. And like I said, now it's actually on the grounds of the White Sands Missile Range. In New Mexico. And this mountain was one of Apache Chief Victorio's hideouts when he was fighting with the U.S. Army, the 9th Cavalry, otherwise known as the Buffalo Soldiers, wow. back in the 1880s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he hid out in this mountain. 
Yeah, they had their uh, their specialties. Uh, the tribes out there at the time, they had their little hideaways, and a lot of them were these uh, mountain getaways where they could observe from on high. Yep. Uh, and they knew all about them and how to get in and how to get out easily, or more easily than you and I, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, Victorio. Yeah, Victorio. Mm-hmm. So um, this guy, Doc Noss, and his wife, her, her nickname was Babe Beckworth. Um, they settled down in Hot Springs, New Mexico, uh, which is now called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. I didn't get into <laughs> the history of why they changed the name. But uh-huh. I've actually passed through Truth or Consequences. Uh-huh. And they went off uh, hunting for treasure. And um, in, in 1937, they were out hunting deer right around Victoria Peak. And it began to rain, and Doc went to look for some shelter under a rocky overhang near the mountain summit. And while he was waiting for the rain to subside, he noticed what looked like a loose big stone. And uh, he reached down for it, couldn't move it, but he dug around it a bit and got his hands under it. And when he lifted the rock, he found a huge hole that led straight down into the mountain. Wow. And he went in there? Well, I got this. So he, he looks in and he sees, like, you know, wood going down the sides, right? So it's a man-made abandoned shaft. And when the rain finally stopped, he went back to camp. So he didn't go down there then. Uh-huh. He told his wife about it, and the two decided to keep the discovery to themselves and not tell the rest of the people that were hunting and go back a few days later. So they went back with ropes and flashlights a few days later after the hunt was over. And Doc uh, <coughs> inched his way down into the mine nearly 60 feet. Boy, oh boy, he could have been killed. Oh, well, yeah, it gets better. gets well, better. Okay. And when he reaches that bottom there at 60 feet, he steps into a little room, you know, like he, they describe it as the size of a small room. And on the walls, there's drawing, drawing sketches, some painted, some chiseled, uh, that he figures are made by uh, Native Americans. And then at the other end of this little room, the shaft continued downward. Oh, boy. So he goes down what he believes is another 125 feet. Holy smoke. Yeah, can you believe this? Climbing down? Yeah. No. I can't imagine. That wouldn't be me, I'll tell you right now. No. So he gets down there to this small, smaller room, and um, he sees a human skeleton kneeling and tied to a stake that's driven into the ground. Oh, my goodness. So this person was, uh, you know, apparently deliberately left down there to die. Yeah, you know, there's some weird circumstances uh, uh, regarding such things as this, where people, uh, some pirates have said or said to have done these things, that when the person dies, they believe their spirit guards the treasure. Yeah. But what a horrific... Oh, yeah. uh, Way to go. Can you imagine? Well, get this. So all told, the accounts say that he found 27 human skeletons down there. 27 skeletons? Yeah. Yeah. All tied up like that? All tied up and dead. Oh, my God. Of course, skeletons are generally dead, I should say. Yeah, well, they usually are. Yeah. Unless you're watching Jason and the Argonauts and they start coming after you with swords. <laughs> <laughs> or you tuned into the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And they actually walk around. Come after you. <laughs> so, he, you know, getting back to the treasure, he went around and in these different little chambers around this room, he found all kinds of things, including coins. Jewels, you know, gemstones, Uh saddles, so like beautiful horse saddles, priceless artifacts, including a gold statue of the Virgin Mary. And he also found some old letters, like written letters, where the latest one was dated in 1880. Uh Uh-huh. And then he sees this stack of what he thinks are worthless iron bars. 
and he guesses that there's a thousand of these bars. But each one of them weighs about 40 pounds, and it's difficult for him to even lift, lift one, let alone carry a bunch of them back to the surface. Mm-hmm. And these iron bars, Bill, they weren't made out of iron. They were gold bars. Wow. Yeah. There must have been some dirt or something encrusting them. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, so, so, gold is gold, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, unless well, they were just uh, dusty and dirty. So, yeah, yeah. you know, he fills up his pockets with some gold toy- coins, a couple of uh, jeweled swords, and he climbs back out of this shaft to see his wife, right? So he's got to climb like 175 feet wow. up to the surface in the mm-hmm. dark, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got a light and a, and a ropes, but still. Mm -hmm. And he had found like a small one of these iron bars that he could fit in his pocket. And when he gets up there, he puts all the stuff down on the ground. And Babe, his wife, rolls the bar over and she sees a yellow gleam uh, where the gravel of the hillside had scratched off centuries of black grime. Mm. So it was solid gold. Wow. Yeah. Hard to believe, isn't it? I know. I know. Let me ask you something. You're probably going to get to it, but I can't wait. Uh, when did when did that become the White Sands like uh, test site? I don't know. I, I'm guessing. Well, you know, they that was in the 30s and 40s where they were, and later where they were blowing off nuclear bombs there. And this happened in 37. You said, yeah, yeah. So maybe it was right at the cusp of the time they were taking it over. I have no idea. I would think so. I would yeah. think so. Yeah. But you um, never know. Like, I don't know how far it is from, like, the center of uh, the the base, of White Sands Base, right? Because, yeah. you know, the military, when they started blowing up some serious stuff there, I'm sure they expanded as far as they could. Yeah, and let's face it, back then it wasn't like Area 51 where they had these sensors out in the desert. You know, it was relatively unknown. It was one for all and all for one in this country, and I don't think well, there was anybody was all, out there. Uh, after they were blowing off bombs, too, nobody wanted to go there because it was all contaminated, right? You, yeah. You would think. Yeah, well, you know. But, uh, yeah, well, it's it's interesting, though. So go ahead. I didn't mean yeah, to interrupt Yeah, so they... Uh, he and his wife started to hang out there a lot and kept exploring and stuff like that. Um, but this is super interesting. So he could never really capitalize on the gold bars because four years prior to his discovery, Congress passed what was called the Gold Act. And this outlawed the private ownership of gold. Mm. Can you believe it? Yeah, I remember a little bit about that gold act. Yeah. Uh they who, who put that into play? Was that like uh Roosevelt? I don't know, the Congress they said so. I don't yeah. Know. Yeah. So it had to probably during FDR, yeah. Mm-hmm. But so he couldn't sell the gold bars on the open market. So he was stuck. So they ended up burying a bunch of them around in the desert down there. Like, while they got them out, they would go and bury the gold bars all over the place. Boy, oh, boy. You know, modern-day treasure hunt, another one, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I'd never heard of anybody looking for the uh, the gold from this area, have you? Well, I read about them here. So they go back and look, but no one's ever found anything after them. Yeah, it's and, a shame, huh? Yeah. Isn't it weird... Whenever it surrounds gold or treasure, there's always some type of snafu that keeps people hungry enough to look at it, look for it, and spend their life savings and their whole life, but they never get to it. Yeah, well, and you didn't know what I was going to talk about, and you bring up the snafu. I got a snafu for you. Okay. So get this. So in the fall of 1939, Doc uh, goes back there. And he wants to enlarge the passageway into Victoria Peak. So it's easier for them to get the gold and treasures out, right? Uh Uh-huh. So he hires this mining engineer called S.E. Montgomery. And they go to the mountain to blast out the shaft. The engineer suggests to Doc that they use eight sticks of dynamite. And Noss is like, no way. This place is so fragile. The expert wins the argument. 
The blast is an absolute disaster, caves everything in, ah. and shuts Doc out of the mine. Ah, you got to be kidding me. Dun, dun, dun. Ah. Wah, you know? wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a tangled web we weave. Yeah. yeah. And then later on, you know, I previewed it in uh, 1949. Uh, he has a business associate there, and they get into an argument, and the business associate kills him. At that site? At that site, yeah. Wow. So bad, uh, bad place. And then, you know, going on in time, there's controversy about the place that the Army was actually trying to dig into the mine, even though... Uh, Doc's wife, Babe, was still alive and actually owned the rights to the gold in the mountain. Like, they were smart enough to go to court early on and get rights to the treasure. And uh, she she accused the military that they were working the claim, had some people sneak in there to see what was going on, and did see what looked like uh, the military mining the mountain. Mm-hmm. And she actually, like, sued the government to block it and succeeded. Hmm. But in 1979, she passed away without ever finding the treasure. And uh, um, a couple of other relatives of hers are still looking for the treasure when this article was written. Boy, oh boy. Pretty crazy, right? It is crazy. You know, and uh, the lust, the gold lust, right? Yeah. Keeps them chasing and chasing. The guy gets killed over it. Well, you look at all these TV shows now, right, of the gold hunting and uh, even uh, Blind Blind Frog Ranch. You're right? Mm-hmm. Am mm-hmm. I saying that correctly? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, Blind Mr. Frog Blind, Ranch. Blind Frog yep. Ranch, which mm-hmm. should be coming back on here again with another season. You know, they're out there in the cavern looking for what they think is Aztec gold. You mm-hmm. know, who knows? Yeah. Risking their lives. And I wonder work. where this stuff came from with the horse saddles and the gold statue of the Virgin Mary. Yeah, there's all different theories. You know, the one is that uh, the Apache chief was, you know, stealing it from folks and putting it there. Another one is that the president of Mexico back there in the early days was on the run and actually left Mexico and came into New Mexico and might have brought a bunch of treasure with him. Yeah, somebody stole it. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was all stolen booty by somebody. And, of yeah. course, whenever you find bars, that's usually indicative of somebody getting a lot of jewelry or heisting stuff and then just melting it for transport. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's freaking crazy. Yeah, so that is the mystery around Victorio Peak, New Mexico. Awesome. And I'll tell you right now, man, this is a pretty interesting uh, Bigfoot account. It was presented to me by a fellow named Trevor Gunderson, uh, resident of Montana. And this is what Trevor had to say, told in his own way. As I told you before, Bill, I'm an old buzzard, and I make no bones about it. Both my father and my Uncle Dave are gone, God rest their souls, and I reckon that sooner or later, the dirt will be covering me and my story. So I figured it was high time to share it. Every year, the three of us would go on several hunts. I'm talking hunting, camping, the whole shebang. We actually hunted quite a bit more, but these trips were planned getaways for the boys. I played the part of the boy at the time, and my father and uncle were the men. These hunts were always a great time for me, and my memories have kept me go- and their memories have kept me going for 99 years and counting as of last July. Wow. Yeah. At the time, I was a young lad but I could steady and fire a long gun, and that's all that mattered. One of the places that we liked to go in the fall was called Dixie National Forest Game Preserve. As you know, I live in Florida now and haven't been up in that neck of the woods in a long, long time, but at that time, which was to say 1950 plus or minus a few years, They held a deer hunt there from October 20th to the 30th. 
It was Southern Utah's finest deer country, bar none. In fact, I still have my father's 5x5 five five hanging on the wall here in Florida. Just to give you an idea of how much, the, how much things have changed through the years, back then you could get a guide for five bucks a day. There were so many deer in there that the last time we hunted, 1,700 out of 2,000 hunters found their mark. You had to wear a red cap, and you could only shoot one buck with horns that were at least five inches long. On this trip, we were camping near Panguitch Lake. And trust me when I tell you that this place felt as remote as remote can be. Panguitch, by the way, is a Paiute Indian word which means big fish. So it wasn't only the hunting that was good there. Now, the name of the creek that I'm about to mention slips me, but it ran north to south right through the preserve. And hunting near it had provided us with more than a few bucks through the years. <coughs> Excuse me. There were areas of this creek where golden green grasslands came from the fringe of the forest on both sides, and they were loaded with game trails. The deer would come out of the timber to eat and get a drink by the creek, and then they would retreat back into the forest. So we used to set up in a blind at the edge of the forest early in the day and lay in wait for the deer to come out into the fields. Once out of the forest cover, you had a wide open and clear shot at your prey. We were in the blind and ready to roll on opening day as the sun was just lighting the horizon. Nothing happens quickly when you're on a hunt in this environment. The sun rises slowly and the deer move even slower than the sun. So we were set up overlooking this open field with the creek running through the middle of it as some deer started to make their way out of the forest. The best bucks, by the way, are always bagged on the opener. So our expectations were high. About an hour into sunup, there were a decent amount of deer in the field, including a few bucks, but nothing worthy of a shot. We hadn't seen another red cap anywhere in the area either, which meant that we had the location to ourselves. The sun, having just broken the horizon to the north, uh, when maybe a hundred yards or so away from our position, a doe came launching out of the timber, heading towards the creek at full speed which sent everything in the field we had been waiting on running in every direction. The doe was running like a hunter from a... Uh, oh, the doe was running like a hunter from a grizzly, and before we could answer why, a huge monster of a beast came running out of the timber hot on her heels. This thing was gaining on her rapidly. In no time at all, they both disappeared into the timber on the other side. Words cannot describe what we were feeling as we watched this unfold <coughs> before our eyes. First of all, the run from the woodline to woodline had to be several hundred yards, which is in no way typical for a deer's running distance. I guess when you're about to be eaten, things change. <laughs> when the monster crossed the creek, it was already gaining on the doe, maybe two steps to one. When the doe reached the creek, it had to run down, in, and out of the creek, continuing towards the forest. This monster cleared the creek in full stride like a long jumper without missing a step. It had to be close to a 40-foot leap. And with just that one move, 
it had cut the distance in half between itself and the dough. Although we saw and heard nothing after the two creatures went into the woods, I am sure this monster got the dough. At the very least, the doe would have had a heart attack before it could have gotten away. That's how fast this hairy beast was running. About 15 minutes after this sighting, we walked over to where the two had come out of the forest. As we stood there looking out over the path it had made through the field, you could make out individual areas where its feet had impacted the grass. My dad had paced out a few of the strides with his own steps, and it was a five-to-one ratio. In other words, it took my dad five steps to make up one of this things, which meant it was covering about 15 feet or more per step when running. Incredible. Mm. I didn't think that was possible for anything living, especially that large, to run that fast. At the time, my father and uncle were estimating that it had to have been well over 10 feet tall based on the height of the grass and the appearance of the larger deer that had been in the field. Needless to say, we had called off the hunt for the day and went back to the camp, somewhat stunned by what had happened. At the time, my father and uncle were estimating that it had... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, This was, by the way, before any conversations were being had about Bigfoot. We had no idea what we had seen. It was simply a giant hairy beast running on two legs. We never thought of running away. But had it come at us, we had three big bore rifles at the ready. This creature made the biggest grizzly look like a dwarf in comparison. As it ran, its hair, which was very long, was flying out behind it. Hmm. I distinctly remember that its head was tucked down well below its shoulders, and its arms were moving so fast that it was almost a blur. I don't think it took it 20 seconds for it to cover the whole open field and the creek, which was a considerable distance indeed. The upper arms of this creature looked like a man's thigh, and I could only shake my head thinking about what kind of strength it must have possessed. That is absolutely nuts. Wow. And Bill, I I know this guy was 99 years old when he told this story to you. How long ago did this happen? Did he he say? He said 1950 plus or minus a few years. Okay. So it was either maybe 46, 47, or maybe even 53, 54, you know, like that. But uh, another guy that says, you know, at the time... Uh, They didn't know anything about Bigfoot. No. You know, uh, what are you going to, you know, what can you say? You know, I mean, it is what it is, you know. No, that is wild, though. Chasing a doe, full sprint, a couple hundred yards, uh, the hair flowing behind it or fur flow. I mean, that's crazy. Now, I thought one of the coolest things about the account was, When he said the deer had to, like, go down the bank into the creek, across the creek, and back up the bank to keep running. Right. This thing leapt over the entire creek, uh, which I think, what did he say? It was like 40 feet? 40 feet is what I, I mean, it's like a $6 million man. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, Leap at 40 feet. Yikes. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine. And the father, uh, his estimation was five to one, his steps to one running yeah. stride. Well, that makes sense, actually. Yeah. Yeah, r- one running stride, five to one. Mm. So, uh, man, these things can really get down and boogie, man. I'm thinking it caught the deer. Yeah, well, I'm thinking too, and I think he's also right. That deer probably would have just dropped dead at some point. <laughs> you know, just 
exhaustion running to you oh, drop, yeah. you know. Yeah, no doubt about it. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. You know, old time stuff. Dixie National Forest Preserve. Uh, I think he said it was in Utah. Southern Utah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, when you hear people talk, he's wearing the red cap. They were required to wear a red cap. I guess when they registered, they gave him a cap, but they had to get one. I'm sure it was partially so they didn't shoot one another. You know. Yeah, and, I, you know, that's funny. I'm thinking about it now. I wonder, our hunter friends out there, maybe you could tell me, at what point was the orange instituted for hunting? Yeah. The orange hat and the orange and or vest or some type of jacket or something, you know? After 2,000 people were killed by accident. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should wear something. <laughs> Other than this furry hat that looks like a deer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the antlers my wife bought me for Christmas. Exactly. You know, the antlers are cute, but you should take those off, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While you're frolicking around in the bushes. <laughs> What's some stuff, man? <laughs> so that's it, man. Uh, I, I like hearing about that... Uh, that gold mine story, it's tragic, but tragedy seems to follow, uh, you know, greed. It yeah, just, I mean, it's just a, there are a lot of stories of greed getting the best of people, you know. And uh, the two partners, you know, shooting, basically almost shooting one another, but him getting shot. It's uh, not unfamiliar territory in in the lore of gold miners, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, it just it happens more often than we even know where people have been killed after, you know, letting on to somebody in secret about, you know, trying to take on a partner or something to help them. Yeah, and you I, know? I left this part out, but the guy that shot him was later acquitted of the crime, too. So he must have proved that it was like he... You know, Doc was going to shoot him or whatever. You know. Oh, maybe it was like a little duel and he got the best of them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There was no mention of the duel, you know, the 10 paces and fire, but I think it was something like that. Yeah, or well, he, he pulled, he went to draw and he drew first, you know. Exactly. But, uh, no, that's crazy stuff. And yeah. excellent story, excellent Bigfoot account. So what do we have in our listener mail for today? Yeah, yeah. So we got a lot of uh, emails in this week, Bill, uh, with a video of this orb, this glowing orb passing across the railroad tracks. Did you see that? I did. Yeah. And I had seen that before. So that's been around for a few years. Mm -hmm. And on one of the uh, television shows um, that does uh, kind of like the old Mythbusters, you know, trying to prove whether it's uh, fiction or possible mm -hmm. or what, they had uh, the guy come forward just a couple of years ago who actually created it. So it was fake, unfortunately. Uh. Yeah, the guy did it with, uh, you know, uh, computer generated. Um, but it looked super cool. You got this bright glowing orb slowly moving out of the woods and across these railroad tracks into broad daylight. Uh-huh. Um, right? And and uh, you're like, what the heck is that? Yeah. And it turns out, folks, sorry, uh, but it was fake. Well, there you have it. I mean, unfortunately... We're up against that in this day and age, you know. Oh, I know. But but still, folks, thank you for sending it in. We love to hear from you. And I'm not here to say, what are you thinking about? It was fake. I thought it was real when I saw it. I just happened to see one of the shows where they uh, debunked that particular one. Mm -hmm. Was that and like? I, and I believed it because the guy was there. Like they interviewed him, mm -hmm. and he had all the documentation, the original files, and stuff like that. So. Yeah, was that like that uh, Expedition X that Josh Gates? Uh... No, you know which one it was, Bill? The one that's out. Um, how come I can't think of one of our favorite uh, shows? Um, geez, I'm not sure where you're going yeah, with well, this. With, with um, the uh, rocket scientist out on the ranch in Utah. Oh, Skinwalker. Skinwalker, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So have you seen the other show you have with the... Where they um, 
it's like the mystery of Skinwalker Ranch and other investigations. Uh-huh. And they look at all of these different mysteries. Um, and this was on that show. It's done. It's pretty well. Uh-huh. Pretty good. It reminds uh-huh. me of MythBusters. Like they, they don't just say whether it's real or fake. It's like it's plausible, you know, could have happened or definitely real or unknown at this time or fake. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah no, it's 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 interesting. And look, it's all grist for the mill. You know, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was on that one. So anyway, okay. yeah, it's good. It's yeah, good. no, it's, it's good stuff. All right, and now we got one coming in from Scott from. Minnesota. Ah, Minnesota. Yes, and he writes in, Hi guys, my name is Scott. I just discovered your amazing podcast. Love it, and I love all the banter, but I have a problem. And folks, I'm reading this one to you because we've heard about this before. It's like a tech support issue, so I, I want to explain it. Uh-huh. He says, I have a problem. I listen through the Apple Podcast app, and the episodes only start at number 83. I know that's probably you can't do anything about, but can you tell me if the earlier episodes are available through other players? I'm in southern Minnesota, a community in north central Minnesota, um, by the, by the name of Remer. I think it's Remer, R E M E R. Has Bigfoot days sometime around the Fourth of July every year. Mm-hmm. Thought you might find it interesting. Thanks for all you do, and yes, I try to always carry more gun than I think I'm going to need. Uh-huh. That's yeah. a man after my own heart. So this challenge, Scott, and others that have written in where you can't find the older podcasts, they're all there. They're in the cloud, as they say. Um, but, you know, we have a, a, we use a commercial distribution platform that we save the podcast to every episode and then it gets pulled upon by all of the popular podcast players out there whether it be amazon apple whatever yeah you know, all, all of them and they're all there scott but sometimes i run into it too when i'm listening to other podcasts where i'm like where are these other episodes and i would just say keep trying you know to search Use the search command in the Apple Podcast Player and look for earlier episodes. But make sure, especially if you're doing it on your phone, that you're in a place with good bandwidth coverage. Because sometimes it'll say that there's none there. Uh huh. Just because you don't have a strong signal. Good point. That's what I found. And when you do the search, perhaps actually type in Bigfoot Terror in the Woods episode 10. Exactly. Call for what you're looking for. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we hear this again and again and again. Uh, uh, We know they're there. It's a question of, in the world of electronics, your being able to access them with your device. Yeah, and like I said, I I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I run into the same exact problem. Mm -hmm. I'm like, like I'll, I'll be... I'll be listening to episode three of a podcast, and I want to go back to episode two, and it's not there. And I'm like, it's got to be there. Mm-hmm. And you just got to keep searching. The biggest, the the typical problem I have is I listen to them when I'm in the car going across rural North Carolina, and what I find is if the coverage isn't good, then they don't show up. So yeah. maybe that's the problem you're having, Scott. But Good point. Anyway, good yeah. point, Kev. Yep. Well, that's our that's our tech support episode for the <laughs> And now we're going to Anna from the great state of Maine. Okay. And she writes to WJ, no mention of me from Anna. <laughs> and she says, Can you give us some more accounts around Rougarou and or Dogman? <laughs> yeah, I'll just whip them up for you. Just whip them up. Yeah. As much as I love the hairy man, the Rougarou and Dog Man bring out a little extra creepiness on a cold winter's night in Maine. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kev, uh, it, it befuddles me <laughs> why some people uh, just need to get the crap scared out of them. You Isn't know these- that what this is all about? Well, I mean, this is mild to me compared to some of these slash, slash oh, yeah. and gash uh, movies that come out, you know, where you're literally going to lose your heart in the seat. Oh, wait, Bill, there's someone at the door. Yeah. 
<laughs> Hello? May I come in and borrow your telephone? <laughs> sure, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Sit over here a minute while I get my samurai sword. <laughs> <laughs> It's razor sharp. Oh, I see you have several of your friends with you. You can all come in. Yeah. Boy, you all have, like, very black eyes. <laughs> Look out. Here comes the sword. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that's it this week, Bill. Good podcast. And thank you, folks, uh, for giving us those five-star reviews. Keep them coming. And please keep sending in your emails. We love to hear from you. And uh, we love to know what you want to hear about, too. Many of the ideas that I present in Cryptids in the News and Other Oddities come from you folks out there. Yeah, excellent. And remember, if you've seen something, say something. Go to our website, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the contact link or button and tell us what you've seen. We'll get back to you and uh, we'll have a conversation. And remember, folks, if you happen to be walking around in southern Utah or like Anna up in the woods in Maine, you better remember one thing. Always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight.